This is Glenn Fulcher with another issue of Language Testing Bites. In issue one of volume 34, Language Testing published a review of Assessing English Proficiency for University Study by John Reed. While we looked at assessing academic English in language testing by its 12 with Alan Davis, the focus there was very much upon the large international tests for university entrance. The focus of John Reed's book is much more upon what the universities themselves do to assess academic English after the students have arrived. Now, this is currently a very hot topic given the rapid growth in international student numbers in English medium universities around the world. And so we've invited John to talk about this field and his contribution to it. Welcome back to Language Testing Bites, John. I believe you're the very first person to have made two podcasts for us. The first one being about one of your other areas of expertise, uh, which is vocabulary. And uh, we made that podcast uh, back in 2011. Thank you for inviting me, Glenn. I guess it's just an accident that I happen to be a specialist on these two somewhat different topics. Well, this time we're here to talk about assessing English for university study. Uh, As I mentioned in the introduction, your book is primarily about assessing academic English post-entry. And I'm starting to get used to the new acronym PELA, P-E-L-A, for post-entry language assessment. So to start off, can I ask you to explain to us what Pella is and what it's used for. The first point to make is that Pella is largely an Australian term. At this point, it doesn't have much currency anywhere else in the world. In the Australian context, it grew out of concerns and public debate, actually, 10 years ago about whether international students in Australian universities had adequate proficiency in English, both to cope with the language demands of their studies and also to obtain employment in Australia once they graduated. There were international students entering university degree programs not just directly from their own country, but through various pathways within Australia. So this led to a more general concern about whether Australian universities were enrolling students who weren't adequately prepared for their studies. One outcome of that was a set of good practice principles for English language proficiency for international students. It was published by the Academic Audit Agency of the Australian Government. I want to highlight two of those principles. The first one states that the universities have an institutional responsibility for ensuring that students are sufficiently competent in English to participate effectively in their university studies. But there's another principle with a direct bearing on assessment, and that states students' English language development needs are diagnosed early in their studies and addressed So this second principle created a motivation for universities to develop assessments to diagnose those needs. To return to your question of what a Pella is, it may be useful to contrast it with a proficiency test like uh, IELTS or TOEFL. So a Pella has these broad features. It's an assessment administered after students have been admitted to the institution and usually after they've arrived on campus. It's paid for by the university, so free of charge for the students. It's flexible in the sense that it can address local needs of students in a particular university or particular faculty. And the results are used as the basis for advising at-risk students on their options for developing their language and literacy skills. My understanding is that two of the best research pillars are the Diagnostic English Language Assessment at the University of Melbourne and the Diagnostic English Language Needs Assessment at your own University of Auckland. Uh, perhaps we can concentrate on the DELNA. Uh, first of all, can you describe the assessment for us? What kind of content does the test have and what are the students asked to do? OK, DELNA at Auckland has a different origin from most of the pillars in Australia. It goes back to the 1990s, growing out of concerns about the academic language needs, not just of international students, but other groups in the student body as well. Uh, There were students from recent migrant families, uh, ethnic minority students, especially those admitted on equity grounds, 
and also mature students, second chance students, if you like, with no recent experience of formal study. So after Delna was introduced in 2003, the university made a decision about 10 years ago that all first-year undergraduate students would take Delna, native speakers, non-native speakers, everybody, about 8,500 students altogether. So Delna operates as a two-stage assessment. The first stage is called the screening, and it's a computer-based assessment which takes a maximum of 30 minutes. It consists of two tasks. One is a test of academic vocabulary, and the other is called a timed reading task. So uh, the students have to find one extraneous word that's been added to each line of an academic-type text. And it's speeded so that only the most competent students can complete all of the items in the time allowed. On the basis of these two screening tasks, about two-thirds of the students are exempted from further assessment. The remaining one-third are told to go to the second phase called the diagnosis. And this is paper-based and takes two hours. Includes listening, reading and writing tasks, uh, tasks of a kind that are similar to those in IELTS and other EAP tests of that kind. So based on the diagnosis results, we end up with about 800 students below the cut score. And we consider that they're at risk of underachievement because of academic language and literacy needs. And they need to make an individual appointment with a Delna language advisor. The advisor reviews the assessment results with the student and discusses the options available on campus for academic language development. Moving on from content and response formats, could you say how the scores are used by the institution? I I guess that here I'm interested in the use of the word diagnostic in the title. I mean, in what sense is it diagnostic? I suppose I'm thinking of the relationship between the content, the score, and the use of the score. The word diagnostic was included in the name Delna before the current upsurge of interest among language testers in language diagnosis as a purpose for language assessment. In the field of language testing, we've given lip service to the concept of a diagnostic test, but we're still figuring out what such a test should look like. So I don't make any strong claims for Delna as a diagnostic instrument, but I'd simply point out that Uh, there are some features it has which are associated with language diagnosis. First one is the basic purpose of Delna, which is to identify students whose academic English ability may not be adequate. And traditionally we say that diagnosis is about identifying areas of weakness rather than strengths. Secondly, in the screening phase of Delna, we use measures of language knowledge, as I mentioned already, vocabulary and timed reading. So here we're asking, do students have adequate knowledge of academic vocabulary? Uh, Are they able to process academic texts quickly? I think these are two key questions from a diagnostic perspective. In the second phase of Delna, which somewhat confusingly we call the diagnosis phase, the most diagnostic component is the writing assessment. We ask our raters to complete quite detailed recording sheets on problem areas in the students' writing, and that informs our advisors in their individual consultations with students. The reading and listening assessments are much less diagnostic in this sense. We just report IELTS-style band scores for these two skills. I have a PhD student working on a conceptual basis for an academic reading diagnosis, but that's work that's very much still in progress. Finally, I'd say our use of the language advisors is very much in the spirit of diagnostic assessment. We don't just send the students their results and direct them to enrol in a particular English language or composition course, as typically happens, for example, with placement tests. Uh, But with Delna, the students have the individual consultation, which I've described before. It depends on the policy of their faculty whether students are required to engage in the language development activities or are just recommended to do so. 
This is a very interesting use of a post-entry test, and it must throw up some fascinating validity issues. On the one hand, I guess you want it to be a good measure of the construct, which is academic English. But on the other, the purpose is to offer students information that will lead to improvements in language knowledge and use that will, in turn, improve the likelihood of success in content-based programmes. I mean, how have you gone about investigating validity and what have you found? First, we need to clarify just what the construct is. You've labelled it academic English, which is true in a broad sense, but I prefer to distinguish at least three more specific uh, constructs. First one is academic knowledge, and that's the one that underlies the Delna screening, where we assess knowledge of the lexicon and grammatical systems of English. Secondly, there's a construct I call academic language proficiency, and this is the basis for the diagnosis phase of Delna, and also for tests like uh, IELTS and TOEFL. So here we find skills-based assessments designed to simulate real academic uh, study tasks. There's a third construct which I call academic literacy, or literacies in the plural, and that's based on all the work that's been done by applied linguists on the discourse of particular academic disciplines. Delna doesn't incorporate this construct because it's a generic university-wide program, but in numerous Australian universities, the Rappel has developed, uh, especially for professional faculties like business, engineering, architecture, medical and health sciences, and these pillars usually involve an integrated writing task with various kinds of input on a topic within the discipline, and the students produce uh, a piece of writing in uh, an appropriate genre, again, for that discipline. And their writing is rated according to discipline-specific criteria. So that's one thing to clarify how we define the construct in an appropriate way. In terms of our validation procedures for Delna, yes, we want good quality assessments that are reliable and meet technical standards. Uh, each new task goes through the standard uh, procedures for test development. Uh, we're also concerned about the acceptability of Delna. There's another perspective on validity, the acceptability to the stakeholders. We obtain regular feedback from students through online questionnaires and interviews. And we've made a number of changes to our administrative procedures based on that kind of feedback. We also have a Delna reference group that meets twice a year with representatives from all of the faculties and various other uh, relevant academic units. And that's a forum where concerns can be raised and issues addressed. Ultimately, of course, we want to show that the Delna process, including the follow-up language development programs, has an impact on student learning and achievement. We do know there's a strong relationship between low Delna scores and the likelihood that a student will obtain low grades, fail courses, or even drop out of the university altogether. On the positive side, uh, it's actually quite hard to demonstrate the impact because, as we know from the many studies of predictive validity of major proficiency tests, there are a lot of factors that can influence uh, academic achievement. But some small-scale interview-based studies that we've conducted have certainly, certainly shown positive effects on individual students. This is really interesting. I suppose that there isn't much research into the use of tests where they're used in institutions around the world, apart from the ones that we've mentioned. I guess this is just my gut feeling, of course, because I think there may be a clash of interest between language and language testing professionals on the one hand and the interests of university administrations on the other. I mean, recently, I had to give a talk on assessments designed by UK EAP departments, and rather tongue-in-cheek, I called it University EAP Assessment, a hostage to fortunes. I mean, international students are now so financially important to many universities that having tests which may flag up widespread language problems are not very welcome. Is this a real policy concern in your experience, and are there any others that we're not quite so aware of? 
Yes, the Australian experience shows it's not an easy decision for a university to introduce a Pella. There are many issues that they have to work through. At numerous Australian universities, Pella initiatives seem to have become stalled at various stages because of the competing interests that you refer to. Senior academic management tend to be very concerned about the costs involved, not just in funding the assessment, but also the subsequent academic language development program that may be required to meet student needs. On the other hand, the message from the Australian good practice principles is that the universities have an institutional, maybe even a moral responsibility here. If they're generating large amounts of revenue from international students, then they should really devote a substantial portion of that revenue to addressing the language development needs of those students. Your first point about the apparent lack of research on these tests gives me the opportunity to plug my new edited book with the title Post-Admission Language Assessment of University Students, which was published by Springer last year in 2016. It contains research-based case studies of post-admission assessments, not just in Australia and New Zealand, but also the US, uh, Canada, Hong Kong, Oman, and South Africa. So this is an indication that there's more research going on in this area than you are maybe aware of, and not just in the traditionally English-speaking countries. To conclude, perhaps we could attempt to do a bit of crystal ball gazing. Where do you think we're going with Pellas, and where do you think we will be in another five years? I'm sure there'll be growing interest in Pellas in the next few years, but they'll be quite diverse in form and in function depending on the composition of the student body at particular institutions and a whole range of other factors. Even in Australian universities, these assessments take many different forms. There's no such thing as a standard model of a Pella in Australia. I believe there'll also be a wider recognition that these assessments shouldn't just be for international students or for students who have English as an additional language. More and more domestic students have academic language and literacy needs that should really be addressed. There are some authors like Ursula Wingate at King's College London and Sophie Akudis and her colleagues at the University of Melbourne who promote the ideal of fully inclusive or embedded approaches where subject lecturers and English language tutors work together to plan and deliver academic language and literacy development. So it's an integral component of the teaching of content courses. That might conceivably eliminate the need for a Pella uh, if the language development opportunities were routinely available to all students through their content courses. There have been some interesting initiatives along these lines, but even the strong advocates of this inclusive approach acknowledge that it's hard work to set up that kind of collaborative relationship in the first place between subject lecturers and uh, language tutors, and even more so to sustain such courses for any length of time. So the reality is there will continue to be a need for Pella-type assessments and for more generic types of academic language development programs for the foreseeable future. Well, John, many thanks for joining us again on Language Testing Bytes and for talking about post-entry language assessment. I'm sure that this will prove a very popular podcast, particularly among all the language professionals who work in University EAP, who are already involved in carrying out this kind of assessment, and those who will soon start to see the benefits of post-entry language assessment as a result of your excellent book and your research. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me, Glenn. Thank you for listening to this issue of Language Testing Bites. Language Testing Bites is a production of the journal Language Testing from Sage Publications. You can subscribe to Language Testing Bites through iTunes or you can download future issues from ltj.sagepub.com or from languagetesting.info. So until next time, 
We hope you have enjoyed the current issue of Language Testing Bites.